axons. So it is predominantly that fraction of the cortical tissue that is involved in, in connectivity or integration of signals within the cortical region locally. So here are the results. Um, it had previously been suggested based on very limited studies of small numbers of subjects and, and a uh, um, small number of cortical areas that uh, prefrontal cortex have more connectivity, more neuropil fraction in humans. And it had also been suggested that there was asymmetry in language-related areas, um, specifically in humans, but not in chimpanzees or macaques. So we wanted to evaluate this more systematically. And um, here are the data. Um, you can see data from both hemispheres side by side across all the cortical areas. First thing to note, there is no hemispheric asymmetry for any cortical area or neural fraction for any species. It does not exist. Um, and then within each species, when you look at uh, the variation on regions, in chimpanzees, the only significant regional difference is that there's less neural fraction in primary auditory cortex. Other than that, regions are very similar in the amount of connectivity reflected by neuropil. Humans showed a different result, and a, a result consistent with the previous studies by, by Katarina Sindafari and, and her colleagues, um, showing that there's actually an amplification or an elevation in the neuropil fraction in parts of the prefrontal cortex selectively, in area 10 and area 45. Um, so, because previous work has also shown that neuropil fraction generally doesn't correlate with brain mass, this suggests that there is selective amplification of connectivity in prefrontal cortex in humans compared to chimpanzees. Um, now, since the neuropil fraction itself is a very gross measure of connectivity and it, it collapses lots of different kinds of data, from dendrites and axons and synapses, we wanted to try to obtain higher resolution information on what might be driving this species difference. Um, and so, uh, in work that was led by a PhD student, Serena Bianchi, um, we investigated the morphology of pyramidal neurons in the chimpanzee neocortex to compare with humans. Um, you can use a very ancient technique, uh, the rapid Golgi impregnation technique, to selectively label uh, a small proportion of all the neurons in the neocortex. No one really knows how this works. But um, fortunately, you end up with about 1% of neurons in the neocortex that take up this silver impregnation. And you can see their beautiful geometry, the, the branching of the dendrites, the spines on the dendritic shaft. And each spine corresponds to the site of uh, an excitatory glutamatergic synapse. And then you can, you can three-dimensionally model these data and quantify it. Um, it's good with old post-mortem tissue, so it's amenable for working with human tissue and chimpanzee tissue. Um, there was already existing a uh, pretty good amount of data from humans showing that neurons in the prefrontal cortex are more elaborate, have uh, more branched dendrites, higher spine density than in other cortical regions. And that seems to, to go along with our evidence from the neuropil fraction, that there's more integrated capacity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, but there was previously no data whatsoever on neural morphology at this level in chimpanzees, or any for that matter. It had never, ever been done. So um, we set out to collect comparable data in chips so we can look at it relative to humans. And here is just uh, um, what the Golgi impregnations look like for single neurons. And this doesn't show up quite as well in this lighting, but then you can take the sections of the neurons under the microscope and uh, trace them um, with software tools. Uh, so you end up with a three-dimensional model of the morphology of the neuron, and then uh, you can uh, apply morphometric analysis to those neurons. Uh, we trace and reconstruct the 10 neurons per region in each individual. And uh, this is just some sample tracings from uh, the regions of interest that we studied in chimpanzees. We studied um, um, four different cortical areas in the left hemisphere. And as you can see from the sample, uh, just like humans, the neurons in prefrontal cortex and chimpanzees are also more branched and more elaborate as compared to um, the other cortical territories we study. And the data bear that out. Um, on any of these morphometric measures, dendritic length, mean segment length of dendrites, 
the number of dendrites, the number of spines, and the spine density, the prefrontal cortical parabola neurons in chimpanzees were more complex than in other regions, just like humans. Um, so this is in fact perhaps puzzling because the neuro fraction data suggested that there were not major differences across cortical areas in chimpanzees in respect to connectivity. You see it here. There might be a reason for this, this discrepancy between data because this is at the level of single neurons, not overall connectivity in a volume throughout the entire cortical thickness. So they're very different kinds of data. And in fact, uh, this technique is selective just for layer three neurons. So it even gives you a smaller um, viewpoint on what's going on. So there might be amplification of connectivity in humans um, in deeper cortical layers, etc. Um, and then very interestingly, when you make the direct comparison of our data in chimpanzees to those uh, previously collected in humans using the exact same methods by our, our colleague at Colorado College, uh, Bob Jacobs, um, what you find is that on average, human neurons are two to three times um, <coughs> more branched in their dendritic array. They have two to three times longer dendritic branch. They don't have a greater spine density. So they don't have single neurons in the human cortex they don't have a greater density of spines or synapses in chimpanzees. But also very interestingly, the regional differences across those cortical areas um, were not significant um, between humans and chimps. That means that there's not a disproportionate increase in the integrated capacity of neurons in the frontal cortex of humans. All neurons across all these cortical areas are bigger and more branched, but you don't have a <coughs> enlargement in the dendritic branching in prefrontal cortex. Okay, so um, I'd like to um, now shift to talk about uh, some studies that we're doing looking at neocortical development in, in humans compared to chimpanzees. Um, and we think that it's important to understand the relationship uh, between <coughs> evolution of human brain and cognition to not only study adult phenotypes. Um, adult phenotypes um, are the result of an unfolding of uh, developmental processes, um, and they're a static endpoint. But so much of what it is to be human occurs through the interaction of the way that our brains grow and mature, uh, how the connections are formed um, in the context of a very rich social cultural environment. Um, and so there are some unique features of the way that the human brain develops, which are probably very, very important for establishing uh, human psychological characteristics. Um, you can raise an ape in a very enculturated, rich human environment, and they, they acquire greater language competency, and in fact, greater uh, sociocognitive competency, but never um, to the extent of modern humans. Uh, so I'll just point out some of the, the differences that we know that occur uh, in brain development between humans and their close relatives. Um, human brains are born uh, already about two times larger than chimpanzee brains. And in fact, there's a really interesting study that just came out uh, from a Japanese group showing that that's because brain development um, um, in utero occurs more rapidly in humans than in chimpanzees. Um, but yet, even though the human brain is born already two times bigger than chimps, it already has, has a lot longer to go uh, postnatally in development. So it's born relatively immature at only 27% approximately of what will be its adult size, uh, whereas in chimpanzees they've already achieved about 36% of what will be their adult brain size. Macaques even less so, about 70% of what will be their adult brain size. So a greater fraction of brain development in humans, it occurs postnatally um, in the outside world in the context of social interactions. And in fact, uh, um, very different kinds of social interactions. Chimpanzee infants, as their brains are developing early, um, are very closely guarded by their mothers, and they don't have a lot of interactions with other group members. And, uh, in all human cultures, in contrast, uh, we practice um, much more of a cooperative breeding strategy where human infants uh, are exchanged uh, for care with other individuals. And so get to know 
other individuals' facial expressions and how to read them. And so this probably has a major impact on the way that the brain develops. Um, so humans get to have their very large brain size postnatally through um, extending a rapid feel like rate of brain development in the first year and a half of postnatal life. Um, whereas in chimpanzees and most other species, uh, there's a leveling off in the rate of brain development um, shortly after birth. So, aside from this difference in the rate of postnatal brain growth, also prenatal brain growth, uh, what else is known about what might be unique in human brain development? Um, uh, there's increasing work using uh, microarrays to study gene expression differences in the prefrontal cortex through development of uh, humans, chimps, and macaque monkeys, mostly done by uh, Philip Kaitovich and uh, Santi Pombo. And uh, those studies have shown that there's a very widespread slowdown or prolongation in uh, rates of gene expression in uh, the prefrontal cortex and for many, many different um, also, some of our colleagues right here in this room uh, have shown that the, um, the shape of change over development um, in humans differs. In modern humans differs from not only chimpanzees, but also from our, our close fossil relatives. And this is very exciting research because it gives us an insight into developmental differences that we can see from paleoneurology. And I'm not going to talk about this too much because I know that we're going to hear more very soon. But when we look at the details of microstructural development, comparing humans and close relatives then, um, what do we know the difference? Most of the data allows us only to see the difference between humans and macaque monkeys. Uh, very distant relatives, comparatively speaking, about 35 million years of, of independent evolution separating us. Uh, no data from apes previously. And what we know from macaques is that there is uh, synapse overproliferation and subsequent pruning that occurs. Um, the overproliferation <coughs> is within the first few months of life, and then pruning um, down to adult life levels very, very quickly. And this occurs synchronously across all cortical areas. Um, the data in humans is actually not great. Uh, this is uh, work by, by um, Utenlocker and Doug Kohler that's been cited over a thousand times. If you look at the actual data, it's terrible. Um, um, no statistical analysis, very small sample size, a hodgepodge of regions and ages. But what it seems to suggest is that synaptogenesis occurs uh, over childhood, longer period over childhood, and pruning uh, in prefrontal cortex occurs later than in other cortical areas. So there's more of a, an extra delay in prefrontal cortex, which would allow greater plasticity, perhaps, in the executive function of the prefrontal cortex to be impacted uh, over development. Uh, now, moving on to connectivity from myelination, uh, we know from macaque monkeys that the volume of myelinated axons um, in the white matter increases until puberty and then stabilizes at adult life levels. So by the time macaque monkeys hit puberty, they're, they're done um, forming the myelinated axon uh, connections in their brains. Whereas in humans, it occurs over a more protracted period, well past adolescence, uh, into the mid-20s and even almost 30 years old. And every car company knows this. Uh, in the United States, every car insurance company, because all of a sudden uh, insurance premiums drop um, in the mid-20s. Um, as as uh, individuals mature, achieve uh, improved decision-making and emotional regulation capacities. So there's this evidence from a number of different um, lines that there's a delay and prolongation of even microstructural events in human brain development compared to macaques, at least. Um, and here's just some uh, data showing this in humans. Uh, you can see the white matter changes. It's a longitudinal study in 103 subjects. Uh, um, if there's still an increase in the time when it's sample, it's a green bar. And you can see that the white matter is still changing into the 30s. White matter volume is still increasing into the 30s. And that's the site of all the connectivity in the brain in the cerebral cortex. So, um, this leads to the hypothesis that uh, delayed and prolonged maturation of higher order cortical networks might be an important feature of the human neural phenotype. Uh, plasticity, amplifying capacity for cultural learning. 
So we hypothesize that uh, acquisition of this maturity occurs over a delayed time course in humans uh, compared to chimpanzees and other great apes, where uh, it hasn't been tested yet. Um, so this might be manifest in the timing of SNAP genesis, which I'm not going to talk about today, but it is something that we've studied, um, as well as the accumulation of <coughs> axons. So before uh, uh, completing the study, we, we have to have developmental tissue from chimpanzees or other great apes. And this is incredibly difficult to acquire in the United States and, and probably elsewhere because uh, there's been a moratorium on chimpanzee breeding uh, set by the NIH for, for around 15 years. And that means that the natural occurring deaths of chimpanzees either in zoos or medical facilities is very limited these days. And so there's a great availability of young um, chimpanzee tissue. But in order to, to initiate these studies, uh, uh, we surveyed all of the vet pathologists in the U.S. that, that might have uh, baby chimpanzee brains on their shelves and managed to pull together a sample of about 14 juveniles, which is pretty good, um, uh, to be able to make these comparisons. So um, what I'm going to tell you about now, research that was led by uh, Dan Miller, who was a, a graduate student in my lab at the time. Um, we studied myelination rates in the cerebral cortex. Uh, we studied this in, in kind of an unconventional way. Rather than using MRI to look at the volume changes in the white matter, um, which others have done, we looked at the, um, the length and density of myelinated axons in the cerebral cortex. We we're limited to do this because it's those 14 juvenile chimpanzee brains we got were not the brains. They're from the pathologists that are cut in a million different ways. So like putting together puzzle pieces. And so we had to do this histologically um, in a way where we could optimize the use of, of small bits of tissue that we could recognize their, their uh, cortical region of origin. Um, so myelin, as you can see from this histological stain from myelin, is very visible in the cerebral cortex once it's mature. Um, it's a fatty substance that surrounds and insulates the axons of some neurons. Um, it facilitates rapid long-range conduction of action potentials and allows there to be greater synchronization of activity among disparate cortical regions. And this sort of synchronicity of firing among uh, different cortical regions is very important in uh, um, cognitive functions and setting the oscillatory uh, um, um, synchrony of, of um, uh, timing functions. So first, we, we looked at this histologically in humans. Um, and we were reassured, because we we're uh, the first ones to quantify this in this way. We were reassured to see a result that's very similar to the neuroimaging from MRI of white matter volumes. Namely, that uh, there is this continued prolonged maturation of myelination in humans uh, past puberty um, in our sample that we could see um, um, into the mid-20s and beyond. Um, and in fact, humans are born with relatively little myelin content in the cerebral cortex. Um, uh, between 0 and 1% of axons in the cerebral cortex show detectable myelination at birth. And then by puberty, you've achieved about 60% of adult life myelination. After, mature, uh, after puberty, we, we finish um, um, maturing with myelin. Now, it's very different from what we observed in chimpanzees. In chimpanzees, they start with a relatively more mature myelinated cerebral cortex. Already at birth, around 20% um, adult-like myelination is achieved. And um, by puberty, they, they have essentially adult-like, fully mature myelination. Um, so this human difference from apes might be important for maintaining enhanced plasticity for learning throughout later stages of development. Um, it's also interesting that the period of post pubertal continued maturation of myelin represents a period in humans that uh, is uniquely vulnerable to certain neuropsychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression. Um, disorders that, that are clearly difficult to, to determine whether they exist in non-human species, but um, uh, seem to be unique in humans. And so this is a unique phase of human neurodevelopment, evolutionarily speaking, as far as we can tell, compared to uh, our close living relatives, and also represents a unique um, window of vulnerability to disease. Um, 
And in fact, it's very possible that many of the changes in uh, the way that the human brain develops and ages uh, might present unique vulnerabilities to disease in our species. Um, I can see that I'm running out of time, and uh, this actually, I, I regret that I won't be able to present um, the data here from um, uh, um, Aida Gomez Robles um, using geometric morphometrics to look at shape change and asymmetry from uh, MRIs uh, of humans and chimpanzees. Um, perhaps, though, it spares me from pretending I know something about geometric morphometrics and being subject to very difficult questions from those in the audience who know more. Um, but we can always talk about these things later. Uh, she's, uh, as I flip through these slides, you'll see that we've completed a study of, of 70 MRI scans of, of humans and chimpanzee brains looking at uh, geometric morphometric uh, configuration of, of landmarks uh, based on uh, sulci locations, uh, looking at uh, asymmetry as well as shape change and thermometry. Um, so I regret that I, I can't spend more time. She has a lot of animations, which is great. Okay, so in conclusion, um, what I was hoping to convey in this morning's talk is that uh, human brain evolution uh, um, in our lineage has involved changes at multiple levels of anatomical and molecular organization. Um, so some of these changes, uh, um, like changes in the size of cortical regions, the enlargement of uh, Burke's area homolog, enlargement of um, the anterior prefrontal cortex, uh, might in fact be evident from um, the surface of uh, endocasts and, and um, might provide um, a window that we can observe in the past from paleoneurological evidence. However, there's still a, a huge amount of change that we now know from doing comparative neuroscience uh, um, at the level of histology, gene expression, connectivity that has certainly changed, um, that drives our psychological differences um, with other species, um, where I think we're, we're going to have to be satisfied with uh, not knowing the occurrence of those events in the past. Um, but hoping that we get more insight into uh, the biological basis of human difference by making um, serious comparisons to our close relatives, the great apes. Um, and I'd also like to emphasize that we're really just at early days in doing um, a serious comparative neuroscience of humans and great apes. And uh, there are vast, vast territories uh, of the brain that have not been explored yet. Particularly, as I alluded to earlier, the temporal cortex and parietal cortex. And this is in part because um, the homologies among regions in those areas are more difficult to discern. And so um, that work will come slowly, but it will come um, as those homologies are determined. So um, with that, I'd like to, to thank you all for your, your attention and for the invitation this morning. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, many different resources uh, that, that provide the kinds of um, tissue that is the fundamental basis for all the studies that we do in my lab, um, all the people who have worked in the lab uh, to produce the research results that I told you about this morning, uh, collaborators and, and funding agencies. So thank you. Yes. Uh, it was great. Um, you talked about the pyramidal neurons in the chimps, and you said that the chimps also have more branching in the frontal areas. You said it's specific to layer three. Can you say more about layer three? Yes. Um, so layer three, um, uh, and also including layer two, uh, contain neurons that are mostly making cortical cortical association projections. So uh, the outputs of those neurons are are going um, um, sometimes uh, intrahemispherically, uh, um, sometimes to uh, just very distant regions within um, the same hemisphere. But they're sharing the results of local computations um, with other cortical areas. Um, and so they're involved in the most integrated associative 
aspects of processing. And um, though it's perhaps fortunate that the rapid Golgi impregnation technique selectively labels layer three neurons and not a whole lot else. Um, so it lets us tell stories about what's going on with the evolution of connectivity um, in this cortical, cortical association layer. It doesn't really allow us to say very much about the evolution of um, cortical fugal projection systems because just because of the technique, we don't get to see those neurons nearly as well. Um, interestingly, in development, though, and this poses a bit of a problem, we've done these sorts of culture coordination studies in development with uh, some of the baby chimps, uh, to compare with data in humans, and um, for reasons not understood, in babies, layer five neurons are selectively labeled, but not layer three neurons. So you can make a comparison of one class of neurons in infants to another class of neurons in adults. Um, but this is, these are the hazards of the particular method. You mentioned at the, at the end of your talk that more research into the temporal lobes and the parallels is interesting, but there is the homology problem. Right. Could you expand a little bit on the homology problem in the temporal lobe? That's probably less of a problem in fact in the temporal lobe than in the parietal lobe. Uh, there, there have been more um, um, intentional comparative studies um, in temporal cortex. Um, I think about uh, I mean, growing out of auditory cortex and the belt and, and parabellum cortex. Uh, there are good data from humans and chimpanzees and macaques from, from Troy Hackett's lab. Um, so that, that's perhaps a little bit less of a problem. Um, middle temporal cortex, however, I think that, that um, the exact homologies between humans and macaques are, are not as well established. Uh, and so one would want to be a bit more firm before going to new species that haven't been examined. Now, in, always, uh, I'm a practitioner of comparative cytoarchitectonics, but I must admit to just you, my close friends, that this is, this is a, a difficult thing to do. Um, looking under the microscope at cytoarchitecture uh, um, is perhaps as much work as it is science. And um, even looking at 10 different human brains and trying to recognize what we call the same architectural areas um, can, be, can be difficult and have with technical problems. Um, there are some computational algorithms, image analysis algorithms to try to get around it. There still is always human um, um, interaction with those results from the computer algorithms. Uh, you can use multiple independent observers to see what the correspondence is. Uh, but this is, this is a problem with visual object recognition. Um, the more markers you have, the better. So if you have um, um, uh, more neurochemical markers to use for correlation, it's better than just using cell body stains. Um, but, but I think having, having gone through the process of, of publishing on volumes defined by boundaries from chimpanzees for regions like Wernicke's area homolog and Wernicke's area homolog, um, um, I think it's a very, very high bar to satisfy reviewers, and I, I think indeed it should be a high bar that the, the homology is clear. And so, in my own lab, so, so I, I, here, here's my excuse in my own lab, is knowing how difficult it can be to convince reviewers, it's much easier to, and given that it takes a long to do these things, it's much easier to start with the regions where more people agree from having done the previous published research that there is homology and where, where it is. Then you can build on that. In order to go into parcelation in middle temporal areas, for example, um, you just have more groundwork to lay. So it's coming, I think, but it, it just it takes that groundwork to do the descriptive. Um, um, uh, work on the site of architectonics. Hello. Hello. Um, can you tell us or tell me <laughs> if you have um, some work done about the cerebellum? I have not worked on the cerebellum very much myself. I mean, there, there certainly are people who do this. Um, um, then, so there is evidence for changes in the cerebellum in human evolution. So, I really focused on the human cortex in this talk. 
Um, but um, the striatum and the cerebellum are both regions that are highly interconnected with the neocortex um, and also in multi-cognition. And there's evidence for evolutionary changes in the human lineage in both of those structures. With respect to the cerebellum, um, one thing I would point out is this is clearly an important part of the brain. It, it contains 80% of the neurons in the human brain or in the cerebellum. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, changes in numbers of neurons in the neocortex are correlated across evolution with changes in numbers of neurons in the cerebellum. So the interplay between them is very closely linked. Um, that is also something that you can you can see some evidence in paleomorology from the shape of the, the um, uh, inferior cranial fossa, and uh, uh, which which shows the marks of the external surface of the cerebellum. And so based on that sort of evidence, um, um, as well as comparative evidence, we know that apes cerebellum are relatively large for primates for their brain size, and so this might have something to do with the kind of um, motor coordination involved in suspensory locomotion. And so having a relatively large cerebellum is something we have in humans as part of our ape ancestry. Um, and having come from a suspensory lineage fundamentally. And then in more recent human evolution, as evidence from the fossil record, you can see some shifts in cerebellar proportions, uh, where, um, as I recall, and someone else would have to, a real paleontologist would have to help me answer this question. But I think that there, there's been, uh, from an earlier episode of relative expansion in uh, the Pleistocene, middle Pleistocene, and then it gets smaller again afterwards. Um, now, there are also increasing studies on the different segments of the cerebellum. As we know anatomically, that they have different patterns of connectivity with parts of the cerebral cortex. So, so certain folia um, connect more with the group. And that sort of comparative evidence also simply helps to support the idea of prefrontal cortex enlargement in human brain evolution. There's parts of the cerebellum that are more <coughs> tightly linked connectivity, with connectivity to the prefrontal cortex are also disproportionately larger. Thank you very much. Um, my question is maybe a little broader and further afield, but yeah. I'm interested in just the variation what we understand about humans, within humans, and within the different primate species. Right. I'm wondering if anybody is focused on um, comparing brains of primates that are raised in more naturalistic settings versus captivity. So I follow up about this, and it, it is a frustration. Um, in many of these comparative neuroanatomical studies um, that are coming out now, it's based on brains from zoological collections and biomedical research facilities. So animals. That, that lived out much of their lives uh, housed in captivity. And um, um, it's, it's interesting to, to think about how that might compare with specimens from the wild. Uh, one would assume that opportunities for locomotor diversity, um, um, also very different social circumstances in the wild where if you don't get along with someone, run away and actually get pretty far away from them. Whereas in captivity, um, individuals uh, might be subject to more stress and, and also very different so social circumstances because of the housing conditions. Um, so a lot of, so to, to, to reassure all of us who are engaged in this science to some extent, um, one of the most, and to answer your question generally, one of the most um, mind data sets for comparative neuroanatomy. Uh, uh, the brain structure volumes collected by, by Heinz Stefan, Heiko Fromm, and colleagues, um, and published over the 1970s and 80s, um, which a lot of people go back to, like Robert Dunbar and Rob Barton, to make these analyses. But that's all based on wild brain collections. Um, it's in more recent times where, where one does not do wild brain collections the way they did in the 60s and 50s. Uh, where we have these captive data. So you can compare um, data from the more recent um, captive collections to, to the wild data, and, and they compare pretty favorably. They're limited sample sizes. Um, um, in my own lab, we have, so it's an interesting question for us because we are now studying um, the brains of wild uh, um, Varunga mountain gorillas from Rwanda. Um, in collaboration with um, the um, um, Science and Conservation and Tourism Board of Rwanda, the Mount Gorilla Veterinary Project. 
Um, and these are individuals who know my history, behavioral records, veterinary records, um, and um, the brains make their way to the United States for both uh, histopathological di diagnosis as well as research. So we have MRIs of them, and we have brain sections, and we're, we're looking at effects of stress that we can correlate in the hippocampus with, with the lifespan. Um, we can also look at how mountain gorilla brains differ from Western Northern gorilla brains, uh, separated by one to two million years of independent evolution. Different species, different ecology, different social structure. Um, but always at the end of the day, you wonder, are you looking at a species difference between mountain gorillas and Western gorillas, or are you looking at the difference between wild and captivity? Um, and that is simply, for practical reasons, so difficult to disentangle um, in those sorts of studies. Um, we know, of course, that, that um, lifespan, um, uh, context, and enrichment makes a difference for brain morphology. Um, so it's impossible to dismiss this variable. Um, when making very broad species comparisons, um, with these sorts of data, uh, I guess I guess you run more of a risk of false negatives than false positives. Um, if if even in the impoverished <coughs> captive context you see species differences, I think that argues more strongly that these are inherent differences in, in how the brain is organized. Um, so that's I, I've kind of walked you through my own. Uh, my own difficulty in grappling with those issues, right? Because these are these are fascinating questions to answer about how species brains differ. But but these days, and I think for very good ethical practical reasons, we are limited to working predominantly with specimens.